Today is Friday, September 23, 2011. My name is Claude Bouchard. I hold the John W. Barton Endowed Chair in Genetics and Nutrition, and I am the Director of the Human Genomics Laboratory at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. I am also a long-standing member of the American Physiological Society. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. William Ansel for the American Physiological Society's Living History Project. This interview is being recorded in the Pennington Medical Foundation Office Suites in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dr. Hensel has been a member of APS since 1960. Dr. Hensel has had a very distinguished research career and has made many uh, scientific contributions while engaging in technology transfer activities as well. In this interview, we will explore the various phases of Bill's career and contributions. Bill, welcome to the Living History Project, and thank, thank you, you for agreeing to be interviewed. Well, thank, thank you for interviewing me. We will cover three time periods of your career, beginning from the time you were born to the end of your military service first. So right. tell us where you were born and the circumstances of your upbringing. Claude, I was born in western Maryland uh, on a farm called the Vale Farm. Uh, this farm had a beautiful old brick uh, farmhouse uh, built, I believe, in 1780s nine or ninety. The uh, only trouble, difficulty was it had no modern conveniences. There was no electricity, there was no central bathroom, uh, no central heating. Uh, heat was by 12 individual fireplaces uh, and it wasn't very efficient. So we were often cold. Uh, this, uh, this old house uh, uh, was, was a landmark and uh, our farm, we had a herd of Guernsey cattle, I think about 40 cattle. Uh, there was a, a small sawmill where my father cut uh, the oak trees that were growing on the farm and we grew uh, uh, thousands of bushels of potatoes, and I, I, I still remember picking potatoes. Uh, uh, there were no mechanical harvesters in those days. It was a back-breaking job. <laughs> so let's move on to your uh, years in school. Where did you attend primary and secondary schools, and were you exposed to a strong science curriculum? I, my uh, elementary education was in a two-room schoolhouse in the near, nearby mining village, Vale Summit, Maryland. It's located between Cumberland and Frostburg in the western end of the state of uh, Maryland. But for high school, I went to Bell High School in Frostburg and uh, uh, there I met very good teachers in math, uh, in, in uh, chemistry, uh, and biology. And uh, I was a member of the uh, math club. I was on the school debating team. And during that era, I became much involved in the 4-H club activities. Uh, our, we had a, a young man who uh, just completed college who came to our county and organized the first 4-H clubs. And uh, I became very active in this. This man was named Milo Downey. And uh, I, uh, I fortunately uh, was able to marry his younger sister many years later. Milo became uh, state director of the 4-H, and then he became the national director. And he was instrumental in, in building 
the National 4-H Center in Washington, D.C. He's a remarkable person, had a remarkable ability to work with young people. Then uh, you live through the Great Depression, beginning around 1929. How was it? Living was very difficult during the Depression. We lived on a farm where we had food, but not very much uh, money. When the bank holiday was declared, and people realized that their life savings had disappeared, they became very frightened and angry. And uh, although there were long soup lines set up in the large cities, uh, many people were hungry. They migrated into the countryside to forage for food. I remember my mother would always feed anyone who came to the door. But as, as things became more violent, uh, my father was forced to tell her that she could not feed anyone that she didn't really know. So these were difficult times. They lasted longer than people realized, well into the 30s. And indeed, they even today influence many of our financial decisions. Recall for us now the years that you spent at the University of Maryland studying dairy science for your bachelor's degree? Yes, I was fortunate in that my uh, faculty advisor was a man named Kenneth Turk, who uh, was also the head of the department at the University of Maryland. And uh, he saw to it that in addition to the usual animal science courses, I had a, a, a number of courses in genetics, physiological chemistry, uh, nutrition. Uh, so I, I had more than the usual background of scientific courses as an undergraduate. So to uh, complete this part, we come to your military service. Tell us about the period from 1940 to 46 and your service during World War II in the uh, European theater, among others. Yes, I, I, was, I graduated from the University of Maryland in 1940, and within a year, I was drafted into the Army and sent to Macon, Georgia for basic uh, training. It's, I saw an estimate recently that more than a third of the 1940 graduating class from the University of Maryland were killed in World War II. Uh, I was, after basic training, I was assigned to a regular Army division, the 8th Army Division in North Carolina. And I, while there, I applied for admission to the officer training school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and fortunately was accepted. So I spent the next three months on uh, combat training in the very hot conditions at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, and graduated uh, with a lieutenant's commission. Uh, we were called 90 Day Wonders. Uh, from there, I, I, had a, I had a leave, uh, went home, uh, and married my wife, Milbury, and the two of us uh, reported to Fort Custer, Michigan, where the new division, the 94th Infantry Division, was being formed. After several years of very hard training in a number of different states, I was rose to the rank of captain was given command of a company of about 200 men, and uh, uh, we, we, in 1944, uh, we uh, moved, were sent to England, and then within a few weeks onto uh, the continent in France. Our first mission was to uh, push the German soldiers uh, along the, the coast of France back into two huge submarine pens at Lorient and Saint-Nazaire. 
these troops uh, were very good troops, uh, had all kinds of supplies, uh, and, and uh, were under perhaps five to ten feet of concrete, uh, which was made for the sub protection of the submarines. So it was decided not to attack them, just to push them into the, these ports. And they remained there until the end of the war, actually. Uh, however, in Christmas of 1944, when the Battle of the Bulge was at its height, uh, it was decided that we would be reassigned to General Patton's U.S. Third Army. We were, we were sent to an area called the Saar Moselle Triangle, which is the area uh, in which the city of Trier lies. Uh, it's roughly a triangular shape, uh, and it was the southern terminus of the German Siegfried Line. It was called, they called it the Siegfried Switch. This was an area of fortification of uh, perhaps 10 miles deep, uh, interlocking gunfire from one pillbox to the next, uh, huge anti-tank barriers, barbed wire. Uh, the German troops had pre-fired all the targets so that uh, they, they just uh, automatically uh, uh, set off a program of artillery and mortar fire. Uh, fighting was severe. It was extremely cold. There were large numbers of frostbitten feet and, and a condition called trench foot, which occurs when, uh, uh, when the feet are exposed to cold, wet conditions for a long period of time. Uh, this, this was very, very difficult uh, fighting. We were fighting against one of the elite German divisions that had been uh, had had combat experience on the Russian front, so they were experienced soldiers, and we, of course, were uh, a few years past draft. We were a draftee division, uh, and not professional soldiers. Nevertheless, in the end, we prevailed. In February of '45. The division launched a mass attack, broke through the Siegfried Line, captured Trier, crossed the Saar River, and raced madly to the Rhine. Patton was uh, very determined to get to the Rhine before any of the other, other uh, Allied uh, troops. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I was wounded uh, during this action uh, at a, a fortified town called Oberleuchen and spent the next year in various uh, military hospitals uh, and uh, actually uh, began my graduate work while still on crutches. And uh, so that's, that's about my military career. So now let's talk about the second part, your life at Cornell University, which extends from 1946 to 1990. First, you obtained a master's and a PhD at Cornell, uh, graduating in 1949. Can you tell us about some of the key faculty who had an influence on you and your career? Yes, uh, there were a number of faculty members who who had a tremendous influence on, on me. Uh, first of all, as my major professor, I chose Sidney Asdell. Sidney was a, a PA, got his PhD at Cambridge University, and was already one of the leaders in the field of reproductive biology. Uh, he, however, had some different ideas about how to train graduate students than most of his, his contemporaries. I remember on many occasions when I had finished a section of my thesis research, 
I would go schedule a conference with him, and at the end I would ask him what he thought might be the best next step. And he always told me, the next step is yours, it's your research, it's not mine. And he belonged to what we graduate students called the, the, the sink or swim <laughs> uh, uh, method of uh, training graduate students. However, as I look back over the years, I realized that to a large extent, my ability to isolate a problem and find new approaches to its solution really came from Sidney uh, Asdell. The second member of my committee was Dr. H. H. Dukes. Dr. Dukes was head of physiology in the veterinary college. Uh, he was a marvel. He was the best teacher I have ever met. He had developed a series of demonstrations in physiology that is unmatched to this day. His book, The Physiology of the Domestic Animals, was the Bible for all veterinary students and agricultural students around the world. I was fortunate enough in later years to write two chapters for his book for several uh, editions, and I, I was uh, proud uh, to have the honor to do so. The third member of my committee was, was Dr. Kenneth Turk. Uh, Dr. Turk was also chairman of the Animal Science Department at Cornell by this time. He, he was firmly convinced that advances in, in animal and plant science would come as a result of good basic science. So he insisted that I have a lot of, of this sort of training uh, in my uh, in my courses. Uh, he often asked me, William, what have you done for the, as, a, as a graduate student and as a uh, assistant professor? Uh, Dr. Turk would often ask me, William, what have you done for the farmers of New York State this week? And I usually said, not much. <laughs> but in the end, I, uh, I, I did make some contributions uh, to agriculture, uh, and particularly to animal nutrition and animal breeding. There were three. We were housed in the annex to Stocking Hall on the Cornell University campus. And in this annex, there were three major laboratories when I arrived there as a graduate student. The laboratory next door uh, was occupied by Dr. Clive McKay. Clive had already made his big discovery that uh, restricting caloric intake in, in rats resulted in an increase in the length of life and a decrease in, in, in diseases such as, as cancer. Uh, he, he was a truly remarkable uh, person, uh, very high energy, uh, a highly organized, uh, top-notch uh, scientist. The third laboratory was occupied by J.B. Sumner. Uh, Sumner had lost an arm, I think in an accident somewhere earlier in his life, and he had, by this time, had won the Nobel Prize for the crystallization of the first enzyme, uh, urease, which he crystallized from the jack bean. And uh, one of the requirements in his laboratory course was to crystallize urease. I must have done it 10 times before <laughs> I succeeded. It was a very difficult uh, and unpredictable uh, reaction. Uh, but uh, uh, he was truly a remarkable man. And I was so impressed with his ability to manipulate laboratory equipment with one arm that, that uh, uh, I, 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 I admired him tremendously, both for his science and for his ability to combat a physical uh, problem. 
These three, three men, Asdell, McKay, and Sumner, uh, taught me uh, the importance of honesty in science, uh, the, the importance of pursuing logical thought. Uh, I, I owe them a great deal. Very impressive, Bill. Thank you. Uh, you all, uh, when you came from the military service, there were also uh, other of your friends who came as graduate students, and some made significant contributions. Uh, can you say a few words about some of them? Yes. Uh, in the early post-war years, say uh, 1946 through 50, uh, a truly remarkable group of uh, biological science graduate students uh, were assembled at Cornell. These people were much more mature than the usual graduate student. Many of them had seen five years of war. Uh, uh, they felt that they had lost five years in their academic career. They worked very hard. Everyone worked at night, usually up till midnight, for probably four or five nights every week. We don't see that uh, anymore. Uh, but these people, almost without exception, went on to great careers in academia, uh, in industry, uh, and, and uh, uh, I think every one of them won some kind of national or international award. Uh, they, they were truly a remarkable uh, group of young men and women. There weren't very many women and as graduate students. I think I only remember two, actually. It, it's hard to single out individuals, but I would like to mention three that were good friends and had great careers. The first would be Ernie Nobile. Uh, Dr. Nobile was a outstanding reproductive biologist at the University of Pittsburgh. He did some extremely important work on the role of the hypothalamus in pituitary function in, in, in the monkey. He went on become, to become dean of the medical school of Texas, uh, and he went on from there to become president uh, of the American Physiological Society. Uh, a second one I'd like to mention is Dr. Bob Wasserman, the discovery of the calcium binding proteins. He remained on the faculty uh, at Cornell. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, uh, a, a truly great scientist. The third one I'd like to mention is my friend Bob Foote. Uh, Bob Foote did probably the lion's share of the basic work that resulted in the development of the artificial insemination industries uh, and the embryo transfer industries. Uh, and he too was a great teacher, uh, has, uh, I suppose, hundreds of uh, graduate students and students of his, of his graduate students. Three very successful uh, men from that era. You joined the uh, Cornell faculty in 1949 and stayed there until you retired in 1990. Right. First retirement. Yeah. Can you describe for us the various phases of your career as a faculty at Cornell? Well, my uh, early work as an assistant and and probably up into the associate professor level, uh, concerned two major factors. One, uh, the development of methods for measuring hormones, reproductive hormones, uh, in blood of uh, all of the domestic animals, but in particular the uh, cattle. Uh, the second was uh, to find the cause of the infertility in dairy and beef cattle 
uh, in New York State, and this is a fact throughout the nation, the, the conception rates were declining. It was a very expensive uh, uh, problem, uh, and uh, uh, we at Cornell, we put a laboratory in a, tra in a trailer and visited more than 200 farms where we studied their, their breeding records for their cattle, took blood samples to run for, to, to, to measure all kinds of organs and organisms. Uh, uh, and it came up with the, it became quickly very clear that the major problem was infection with an organism called Vibrio fetus, which was transmitted uh, in natural uh, breeding. Uh, by this time, Dr. Foote had discovered that addition of antibiotics to semen uh, prevented the spread of this disease. So many farmers uh, made the switch from natural mating of their cattle uh, to artificial insemination. This not only solved a, a, a serious infertility problem, uh, but resulted in the tremendous genetic progress that we've seen in, in our, particularly in dairy cattle production uh, over the years. Uh, so these, these were important uh, contributions. Uh, later, uh, I moved from the animal science department to the veterinary college and became chairman of the physiology department, uh, a position which I held for uh, five years. Uh, and during this period, uh, my major work concerning the control of ovulation in uh, not only domestic animals, but all animals, uh, we were the first to show that the hormone, pituitary hormone, luteinizing hormone, LH, is responsible not only for ovulation, but for maintenance of the corpus luteum and uh, for the maintenance of progesterone production. Uh, this was a very unpopular result. Uh, most people didn't believe it for at least five years, uh, but finally, uh, it, uh, the, this work has withstood the test of time, and it's now uh, generally uh, accepted. Uh, these studies led to uh, the development of schemes uh, to synchronize the Easter cycles of, of animals, uh, particularly dairy and beef cattle, so that large numbers, hundreds, could be artificially inseminated in one day. Uh, Easter cycle synchronization uh, schemes, uh, uh, we were one of the pioneers in, in developing these schemes. Now they have been improved and large numbers of particularly beef cattle uh, are, are, uh, have their Easter cycle synchronized and are artificially inseminated. And again, the genetic progress that's resulting in the beef cattle, uh, artificially bred beef cattle, is, is tremendous. Uh, so uh, I, it was not until 1990 when I uh, uh, left Cornell and came to uh, LSU that I uh, changed the emphasis of my work to work with embryos. A major part of my work during this period uh, concerned the control of the regression of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is of course necessary for maintenance of pregnancy and during each Easter cycle in every species it grows and then regresses in a very short period of time. Uh, uh, we were intrigued by, by uh, this mechanism and we were the first to actually uh, to show 
that a product of the uterus uh, was responsible for the regression of the corpus luteum. And this is a remarkable regression. This gland goes from about five grams when producing huge amounts of progesterone to a, an organ that's less than one gram and consists of all uh, essentially dead cells. All of this is done within a period of four days. And I had often thought that if we, under, if we were able to understand truly the mechanism involved in this rapid regression of the corpus luteum, that we would be able to effectively treat cancers. Uh, so we concentrated our work in this area. Uh, we were able to show that a substance leaves the uterus through the utero-ovarian vein, and then by a mechanism by which this, this substance is transferred uh, from the vein to the artery, the opposite direction that we usually think of. Uh, it, it short circuits the general circulation, uh, goes right back down the ovarian artery and causes regression of the corpus luteum. Uh, a number of examples of this veno-arterial transfer have since been discovered. Uh, but at the time, uh, it was very hard to believe that such a thing could occur. Uh, nonetheless, we were able to, erect, uh, uh, to isolate from extracts of bovine endometrium arachidonic acid, which is the precursor of prostaglandin F2-alpha. And we and others working as the sheep showed that the PDF2 alpha was the active substance involved in, in regression of the corpus luteum. Uh, uh, this is now widely accepted. Uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha is used uh, in, in treatment of fertility and infertility. Uh, it is also widely used in these methods for synchronizing the estrus cycle. Uh, in the process of doing this, we learned that the corpus luteum is composed of two kinds of cells, one family of cells that arises from the theca internal layer of the follicle, the other arises from the granulosa cells. Both of these cell lines produce uh, progesterone, although the biochemical methods involved are somewhat uh, different. But this was a very fundamental piece of work, uh, and uh, we, we spent a lot of effort. In fact, at one time, I was called a Mr. Corpus Luteum. <laughs> uh. Before we uh, complete our survey of that period of your life, can you tell us a little bit about your first scientific discovery and how exciting it was? Yes, it stands out in my memory. It, uh, it was as a result of what our friends in pharmacolo pharmacology call skunk work. That is work that's not officially recognized, but allowed to proceed, uh, often with no well-defined uh, financial backing. Uh, I was eating dinner one night with a young uh, scientist, a pathologist from the veterinary college named Kenneth McEntee. And he told me for the first time about a strange disease in cattle that was assuming almost epidemic uh, uh, distribution. Uh, and in this disease, the cattle developed skin about two inches thick, uh, which resembled armor plate. Uh, the, the animals uh, lacrimated continuously. Their face was always wet. They lost their appetite, and, and many of them uh, died. This, this, uh, this disease, uh, often called X disease, 
was prevalent in the United States and in, the, and in Germany. And the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and the state of New York both had special appropriations to study the disease. Uh, Dr. McEntee said he doubted that it was due to a virus, as people had, uh, had, had previously stated. Uh, so uh, we began to think about uh, uh, some kind of a contamination. As luck would have it, about a week after our conversation, it was discovered that a group of calves fed breadcrumbs collected from beneath the slicer of a bakery in Burlington, Vermont, uh, had, had developed hyperkeratosis or X disease. So Dr. McEntee and I dashed over to Burlington, Vermont, and brought back a half ton or so of these breadcrumbs, and we started to extract them to see if we could extract the active principle. Uh, we didn't know what to extract with, but I had been using ether to extract the, a hormone, so we, we extracted with ether, and sure enough, the first extract uh, killed calves with the typical symptoms of the disease. We then went to uh, separating fractions of this uh, extract uh, using column chromatography, and as we got uh, more and more pure samples, uh, one day while the sample was sitting on the lab desk, it crystallized. Uh, we ran this to the chemistry department and uh, subjected it to uh, spectrophotometry and very quickly determined that the causative active ingredient was uh, a, a mixture uh, of uh, naphthalenes, chlorinated naphthalenes, di, tri, and tetrachloronaphthalene. Uh, uh, this uh, compound had been added to high-pressure lubricants, and uh, one of these lubricants had been used on the slicing machine at, at the bakery. Uh, shortly after, uh, another source of the disease, a wood preservative produced in Germany, was also found to contain large amounts of highly chlorinated naphthalenes. Uh, Dr. Olofsson, the head of the pathology department uh, at, at the veterinary college, traveled around the world explaining the cause of this disease, and within a year it disappeared. Uh, most people today have never heard about it, uh, or perhaps fortunately. Uh, but th this, we solved this problem within two years. Uh, and it certainly bolstered my confidence at a time when I needed some, some confidence because my major project, the measurement of hormones in, in blood, was running into obstacles. We simply didn't have the methodology to do that as we do today. Uh, but uh, later we, we were able to measure hormones accurately, and in 1972, I was able to present uh, hormone profiles throughout the Easter cycle for uh, the major domestic animals, and my friend Dr. Nobile, who we mentioned previously, at the same meeting of the American Association for Advancement of Science, presented the hormone profiles for primates. Uh, so the progress was slow, but uh, the methodology uh, did develop and the results were finally obtained. Okay, now Bill, we're moving to the third period of your career, which extends from uh, 1990 to today. Uh, you joined LSU after you were required by state law to retire from Cornell University. And in 1990, you were appointed as the Gordon Cain Professor of Animal Physiology at the uh, Louisiana State University Ag Center. And you subsequently moved to the Pennington Biomedical Research Center uh, in, in Baton Rouge. 
So can you tell us about uh, the, the lines of research that you pursued in these new positions? Uh, yes. <coughs> During my first years uh, on the main campus at LSU, I continued to do some of the work with the corpus luteum. Uh, particularly, we looked at the possible role of nitric oxide uh, in corpus luteum regression and did some very elegant experiments in that area, and, and nitric oxide does indeed seem to be involved in, in the process. I also started a series of experiments uh, aimed at determining the nutritional requirements of early embryos. Uh, we used bovine embryos, which are readily obtainable from a large slaughterhouse, uh, fertilized them in vitro, uh, grew them up to the blastocyst stage uh, under various uh, 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 incubation conditions and with various incubation media. Uh, it, uh, one thing that became uh, obvious was that uh, uh, the contribution of the co-culture of embryos with other cells, uh, usually overduct epithelial cells, uh, was very much dependent on nitric oxide uh, concentration. And we were able to uh, by reducing nitric oxide production, we were able to improve the development of bovine embryos. This occupied several uh, years uh, of work uh, and uh, resulted in several patents uh, for these uh, methods of improving embryo cultures. Uh, this, this went on until 1994 when I moved to the Pennington Center. And, and even, uh, even after moving to the Pennington Center, we still did some very significant experiments with bovine embryos. Then, Bill, why did you shift from reproductive physiology to cancer research beginning around 1997? A combination of factors were involved. And first of all, in 1997, my wife, Milbury, uh, died of ovarian cancer. The physicians who, who treated her uh, told me that they really felt that they needed better drugs, that they, the drugs they were using to treat ovarian cancer was simply inadequate. And uh, one of them in particular encouraged me to consider getting into the cancer field, saying that people with my training were much, much needed. Uh, at about the same time, I attended a conference in Poland having to do with the pituitary hormones, in particular, uh, LH, the hormone that causes ovulation, and LHRH, the hormone that causes the release of LH from the pituitary. And uh, at this conference, a friend of mine, Dr. Rao from Louisville, University of Louisville, uh, described the, a half a dozen different cancer cells that expressed either LH or LHRH receptors. Uh, I had known that some cancer cells expressed LHRH receptors, but I had not known, that, did not know that any of them expressed LH receptors. At the same time, the chemists here in the chemistry department at LSU uh, were doing a lot of work making synthetic lytic peptides. These compounds have some unique chemical properties 
They're small peptides, uh, usually uh, 10 to say 30 amino acids. Uh, and they have the unique ability of destroying the cell membrane. So at this conference, it suddenly struck me, why not use these receptors for LHRH uh, or uh, LH, either one, uh, as targets uh, for cancer drugs? So I came back and talked with my fellow workers, uh, Dr. Fred, en Fred uh, Enright, uh, Carola Leuchner, uh, and Martha, v Martha Juban, and we decided to try to synthesize some of these compounds. Uh, so uh, to make a long story short, we were able to make conjugates of different lytic peptides uh, with segments of either LH or with LHRH itself. And we, we tested these compounds in vitro in the lab first. They killed cancer cells. And then we tested them in, in, in mice. Uh, a, a good example of this is shown in, in the next, in the, in the next figure. Uh, and as you can see, the cells on the left are untreated. And you can see the green uh, membrane surrounding the cell. Five minutes after treatment with a lytic peptide conjugate uh, called EP100, the, the cell membrane is largely dissolved. And within 30 minutes, it is completely broken up. And within 60 minutes, the cell is dead. So these are rapidly acting compounds that seek out the receptors expressed by the cancer cells and kill the cell uh, by uh, destroying the membrane surrounding it. We, we then tested these compounds in vitro. And as you can see in the next slide, uh, we, we have a conjugate of a lytic peptide called HEC8. Uh, uh, with LHRH, and as you can see in the left-hand panel, A, uh, the, the tumor is of uh, the saline-treated controls is very large, and if we give the LH and the hecate unconjugated, it's still very large, but when we treat the mouse with the conjugate, the uh, prostate cancer tumor is almost completely regressed. Uh, so, so we later found out that a number of uh, cancers express uh, either LHRH or LH or both. And these, in, in, and these drugs are effective then against prostate cancer, breast cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, and most recently, we have found against pancreatic cancer, which is exciting because there is, as of now, no effective treatment for pancreatic cancer. Who could have guessed that work on the bovine corpus lithium would yes. lead to the development of new cancer drugs? Yes, it, it, is, it, is, it is amazing. But as a matter of fact, my interest in receptors for these pituitary hormones uh, played a major role here. Let me now go to the last question, Bill. Uh, over the last 15 years, uh, you have been very successful in, in your uh, cancer research. You have had the new patents and technology transfer activities, culminating in the creation of a biotech company called Esperance. Can you tell us about the company and what it does and where it's going? Well, Esperance Pharmaceuticals Incorporation is, is, is as of now, a very successful startup company. Uh, 
It's, uh, it's lead compound EP100 that I just talked about uh, has now been carried through phase one human clinical testing and uh, most recently received uh, support uh, from a, the world's third largest drug co pharmaceutical company, Sanofi, headquartered in Paris, uh, uh, and, and they are now starting phase two clinical trials. Uh, the company is headed by Hector Alila. Alila was a graduate student and later a postdoctoral student uh, of mine at Cornell. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, he left Cornell uh, to join Smith Klein Pharmaceutical Company uh, and has been in the pharmaceutical, uh, in pharmaceutical companies ever since. Uh, so he has a lot of experience. First of all, he's a very good scientist. And second, he's had a lot of experience dealing with the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, uh, we're, we're very proud of the progress that uh, this company uh, has made. Yeah. At, at this phase of your career, you go to meetings, you meet your former students, uh, postdocs, fellows. Uh, yes. How interesting is that for you? It's the most satisfying to go to the meetings and I have some nice young lady come up and tell me, you are my scientific grandfather, or in a few cases, you are sci my scientific great-grandfather. <laughs> and then they will trace the lineage of graduate, former graduate students and graduate students of graduate students as to why they are uh, my uh, scientific descendant. Uh, I admire them very much, and there are a tremendous number of them. I, I have approximately a hundred uh, graduate students and postdoctoral students uh, that have uh, trained in my laboratory over the years, and uh, I'm very proud of their achievements. Well, thank you, Dr. Hansel, for a wonderful interview. Congratulations on a very successful scientific career. Thank you. And uh, we wish you many more years of scientific discoveries and research translational success, as you have done in the last uh, couple of decades. Well, thank you, Claude. I, I still have interest. In fact, we have several new uh, conjugates that we are now testing uh, for their anti-cancer activity, and I hope to continue. This completes our recording of this uh, uh, session for the American Physiological Society.